Jordan Bass is deciding on September 1st. Could Pitt be it that day? And then we're going to talk a little bit about the backyard brawl, what it can mean for recruits, and could something like that contribute to a recruiting bump? We'll talk about it today on this episode of Locked on Pitt. Our Locked on Pitt, your daily podcast on the Pittsburgh Panthers. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to the Locked On Pit Podcast, everybody, on this great Friday. Sunny outside. Pitt getting very, very close to the first game. We're less than a week away from the backyard brawl, so big times there in Pittsburgh right now, folks. But first, as always, as we do in these segments, I'd like to thank LinkedIn Jobs for being the official college football recruiting sponsor across the Locked On College Network. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash Locked On College. Terms and conditions apply in the title sponsor today is Bet Online. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. And now I'd like to welcome in a, a very, very nice guest that we have on all the time, gives us great recruiting info, John Garcia Jr. John, welcome back to the show, man. Good to be back on with you, Nick. Uh, like you said, man, we're almost there, less than a week away from, from that game, and obviously just a couple days, or really one day away, uh, from college football kicking off in general. So it's it's a great, great time of year. It's a great time of the year, and also Pitt has another thing happening on September 1st that – Certainly, the backyard brawl is the big focus, but Jordan Bass, a linebacker that they have been targeting big time in this recruitment era. They brought him on for an official visit. They really like this kid, uh, and he is deciding on the day of the backyard brawl, which is very interesting. I don't know if that's coincidental or not, but what do you think of Jordan Bass thus far? Well, he's such an interesting recruit, right? Uh, like you mentioned, he's he's projected to play linebacker at 6'4", 205, 210 or so, but when you watch him play on tape, he's lining up at safety. He's lining up at rover. He's playing traditional linebacker. He's working down in the box. He's kind of all over the, the middle third of the field, if you will, for his high school's defense, and for good reason. He runs incredibly well, a guy who has an instinctual just nod for the football uh, and really works well coming downhill in kind of old school seek and destroy fashion. So this is a, a truly modern, long, rangy linebacker prospect that really fits what you want to do in the modern age because it's about three down value. So what can you do on third down? Well, in Bass's case, he could cover. He could certainly run. Uh, he could also probably rush the passer with the type of twitch and frame that he's already built at over 200 pounds. You expect him to be a little bit heavier when he does get to his college of choice at the next level. So truly a, a potential three-level defender, which is just not something that we get to talk about every day uh, in, in high school and, and in college football recruiting. So big fan of his game, his upside, the athletic traits are certainly there for him to be an impact player uh, when he plays SEC ball because all five of his finalists are, are in the ACC. So that will that's the known and the tangible in addition to that September 1st decision date. Yeah, and that is very interesting. The offer list is pretty good as well. Boston College, Duke, Ole Miss, Penn State, South Carolina, Syracuse, Vanderbilt, Virginia, Virginia Tech. Now, obviously, he's a Virginia kid, so you always worry about VTech, Virginia. You worry about those schools in that kind of recruitment. But Pitt, it sounds like, has done a really good job of trying to get in here, and Pitt has had recent success in Virginia recently in that 757 area. Rodney Hammond's from there. He's a really good running back for them. They drew out Miles Alston. Um, a number of guys have come from Virginia to Pitt in recent years. Do you think Jordan Bass could be the next one? I do, Nick, and, and I feel like this is more of, of a two-horse race. I know he's got five finalists out there, like you said, North Carolina, UVA, BC in there as well, but it, it feels like it's about the other two. It feels like it's Pitt and Virginia Tech, and if you track the visits – that tells you, you know, almost gives you confirmation because those are the two official visits he took in the month of June, pretty much back to back uh, between the Hokies and the Panthers. So it does feel like it's more of a two horse race in that regard. Uh, like you said, Pitt does have some precedent in winning some battles in the state of Virginia. And, and I think right now, you know, 
one relative to the other. Pitt has been able to recruit him for a longer period of time uh, because, of course, uh, Virginia Tech is under new management with Brent Pry uh, as the new head coach there um, in Blacksburg. So I do think that Pitt has been able to benefit from a more longstanding recruiting approach, multiple visits up to Pittsburgh, including that official that we talked about in the month of June. And and look, the, the September 1st commitment date is – Interesting. It's something you definitely keep an eye on relative to Pitt playing that day. Virginia Tech is not scheduled to play that day. And look, everything about the the latter stages of Bass's recruitment has pointed to a calculated approach, even in informing the media that he was going to commit on September 1st. He also informed them that it was going to come out in a series of videos with the conclusion of those videos set for September 1st. So even the announcement comes with a true uh, precise calculation so in that regard i do think we're we're, we're kind of given the green light to read into that september 1st verbal commitment date and i think that screams pit at this point even going back to may june july it felt like pit and virginia tech were separating themselves within his top five and and even in some respects checking in on some sources in the state of virginia it felt like Pitt was the favorite really once the calendar flipped over uh, to that big dead period um, in July and August. So I do think this uh, is potentially Pitt's race to lose. But of course, Virginia Tech has been able to maintain communication with him and sell him on the future vision of, of that program and how it's now going to be different under Brent Pry. So I do think there has been some time for VT to close the gap. But, but I do think Pitt had a sizable lead going into the summer months that has only been reinforced and solidified with the official visit and again the commitment date to me with a calculated type of recruit very smart and and ca uh, not so casual recruit in terms of how he's handled the process I do think uh, that screams pit in the end uh, relative to that unless it's a very big smoke screen to to put on for the in-state school which a hey, stranger things have happened in recruiting but to me with how calculated bass is especially publicly with the process I do think that that date lining up with the backyard brawl does does scream loudly. And Pitt would love that. They had two other linebackers right now, Rasheem Biles and Braylon Lovelace. Now, Biles got off to a great start, but how do you view that linebacker class? Let's say Bass does commit to Pitt. How do you view a Bass-Biles-Lovelace class for Pitt at linebacker? Well, I think you've got some nice variants. We talked about uh, the range uh, that, that Bass would project with, and he would be kind of your – your flex guy, the guy you could line up literally deep as a safety or a guy you could bring all the way up towards the line of scrimmage. Loveless is similar in that he's a, a bit of a lighter player. I think he's listed around 205 pounds right now coming out of Pennsylvania. So he's one that you would expect to be more of your classic will linebacker, the off-ball backside linebacker who you're going to ask to cover uh, running backs, tight ends, and play a little bit more comfortably uh, in space uh, and then the other is, is a bit of a combination of the two a little bit more conventional in his makeup a little bit more downhill and and perhaps built for the middle because I don't think Bass or Loveless are, are really built to be kind of your your Mike linebackers of the future captain of the defense types they're more supplements or compliments I should say to that Mike backer type so I do think you've got some nice variants in what Pitt is trying to build at the linebacker level and it makes you wonder uh, Nick you'll know this more than me would they be done at linebacker should Bass pick Pitt on September 1st? I would imagine they would be at that point. Um, don't see them adding four linebackers. Linebacker room will have some turnover, of course. Savasi and Dennis probably going to the NFL. But I do expect that if they get Bass, they're probably done at that position. So they certainly are hoping they can land Bass. But I want to talk about that backyard role because I know that it's such a rivalry and it has such a mystique around it. And I want to talk about that in terms of – of recruitment. But first, folks, I want to let you know about BetOnline because BetOnline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your betting needs. Find all your favorite sports, events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. Find reviews and news of every league, including the MLB, NFL, MA, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, even golf. There's so much on BetOnline and continues to be your top resource for all your sporting wagering information from live in game betting, scores, podcasts. They have you covered. Head to BetOnline today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trend and the action happening right now. Bet online, where the game starts. Now, John, I do want to switch over to the Backyard Brawl because there are a few kids 
namely Whippeal kids, come into this game. Now, obviously, it being on a Thursday means you're not going to get a Hakeem Williams or anyone right. like that coming up because school is a thing. And so it's hard to travel on a Thursday. But we've already seen some 24 kids – Lovelace is coming to the backyard brawl and their 23 commitments, but you have guys like Quentin Martin, for example, a composite five-star in the Whippeal that's probably going to be at this game. Cameron Lindsay, Pete Gonzalez, all these kids are local Whippeal kids in the 24, 25 classes, and Pitt's going to have them here at the backyard brawl. What can this do for Pitt in terms of recruiting, especially in the Whippeal? You know, we, we, we've talked about the Whippeal quite a bit, uh, Nick, and it's been kind of up and down for Pitt, right? There's been a lot of programs that have been able to come in and pull some great talent out of there, and Pitt has tried to counter by keeping some of the other players home. So I think the, what the doctor orders in that type of back-and-forth, uh, I guess, perception with the local recruits is a huge home game against a rival. It, it sounds so simple, uh, but I do think that um, because of other circumstances, this is something that we haven't really seen at, at a high clip lately, especially early in the season. I think that provides there's, there's so much excitement. There's so much juice around college football right now. But when you get to that Thursday, that September 1st game, this is kind of the game. This is the, the national showcase prime time, all the elements you want to showcase not only your team, but your your obviously NFL stadium the locale, all that stuff, your opportunity to do it is not only hyper local and regional because you're facing a legitimate rival in West Virginia, but now it's, it's the prime time kind of national game of the night. So it just lines up perfectly for Pitt to, to sort of begin its title defense against West Virginia, obviously not a conference game, but the hype, the momentum, the, the, the real hatred between the two, I feel like people don't know. I I've experienced it. I've, I've been to both stadiums multiple times and, and you, you feel it when these two line up against one another, or even when you hear one group talking about the other, but I don't think people outside of that region really understand kind of the vitriol between both of these parties. They're, they're so very close. I don't have the exact mileage, but they're so very close to one another that it breeds as much uh, rivalry uh, pageantry, if you will, as, as programs that are in state rivals, Virginia, Virginia tech, Alabama, Auburn, all, so on and so forth, Clemson, South Carolina, this feels more like an in-state, uh, recruiting or in-state rival, I should say, when, when you talk about Pitt, West Virginia. So to be able to showcase that at Pitt game one kind of works out as ideally as possible because you're, you're going to be the favored program. You're going to be the team expected to win the game and expected to contend once again in the ACC. So this is the total table setter for all of that. So naturally, like you said, because of the logistics of a Thursday night game, you're not going to be able to bring in that, that national footprint from a recruiting perspective. But that group will get satisfied on television and through technology. But the local group can come in and experience it live and in color and feel it. Uh, the atmosphere, the rivalry, all that stuff, the bitterness, vitriol, whatever comes with it, they can come and feel that even before the game at the tailgate and, and the, the overall atmosphere that Pitt could potentially create here. And it just creates a different opinion on the the level that Pitt is on. You know, th it's been an upward trajectory for quite some time, but one of the knocks, and we've talked about this, is playing in a big metro where there are great pro sports teams left and right, and you are sharing one of those stadiums with the sports team You know, in, in the city. Is that a good and a bad thing simultaneously? That answer is still yes, but here is one of those opportunities to start pushing against that perception. If it's loud, if it's rowdy, if it's raucous, like it should be to, to open up that type of game, then recruits can start to feel that and begin to create their own perception relative to pit at home, which is something that the Panthers don't get enough credit for. And listen, the, the Whitby recruiting, it's going up right now because look at the 24-25 classes. There's a lot of good players in Western PA now. There were only really three or four Whitby recruits in the 23 class. Pitt has one of them in Braley Lovelace, but they lost Rodney Gallagher to West Virginia. And right. so – they, they lost – West Virginia recruits to Whitfield just about as much as Pitt does, just about as much as Penn State does. Tamia Robinson went to Penn State. So Pitt lost the top two guys, got the third guy on the board, but they lost the top two guys in the Whitfield 
to WVU and Penn State. And this is, I think, a big game for them because you look at 24, Quinton Martin, uh, Rico Scott out of Harrisburg. It's local enough for them to go out and, and bring him in for this game. You have Anthony Specka um, coming in there. So you have a ton of guys. Cameron Lindsay, uh, Jasir Whittington's from Philly, but he'll probably be at this game. Uh, so this is a really good year. 2024 is a great year. You have Pete Gonzalez, who is a Pitt legacy recruit. Um, that's a Pitt legacy. Then you have... Ryan Corey, who's a really good offensive lineman for Pine Richland. Again, that's another big Pitt connection that they have. That's a pipeline for Pitt. So Pitt, this is a huge opportunity for Pitt. But in terms of local perception, I think you hit the nail on the head. But I also want to talk about out-of-state guys. So Hikeen Williams is probably going to be watching this game, I would imagine. I would He's going to be glued to his TV. I, I'm going to assume other 24 guys that Pitt might be in on or other top-rated 23 guys that Pitt is still in on are going to be watching this game. What can those guys glean from this just on a TV? I think it's the same kind of deal. You can kind of, you know, put the volume up and, and feel the atmosphere. If, if it's if it's competitive and it's, you know, the, the anticipation should be high for everybody, right? Everybody going into game one. Everyone right now listening, your team's undefeated. You know, Pitt fans, West Virginia fans, everybody, your team is undefeated. There should be some level of optimism and hopefulness that comes with almost the, the, the romantic side of college football and, and, and a, a new season that, that is right here on the brink. So, again, with that being the national spotlight game, you don't even have to have a stake in the race to, to turn this bad boy on. You just say, hey, there's a big rivalry on a Thursday night. Okay, while well, I'm eating dinner, what else am I going to do simultaneously? Then pop that thing on. So then you, you quantify that for recruits who are actually involved in, in this to a degree. And now it's your first impression of what Pitt now will look like. They've been sold on 2021 and Pickett and Addison and the ACC title and all that fun stuff for months, basically since December, right? We've been they've been sold on that for for eight or nine months. Now it is your first impression of hey, Pitt. It's about sustainability and it's about creating that first impression, particularly on offense without some of those big names that we saw last year. So I think for an Ikeem Williams in particular, how does how do the receivers look uh, under Underwood? How does the quarterback play look with Keaton Slovis? Does it feel similar to where you can now start to say, this pit thing is going to be a bit of a... Sorry, I muted myself there. It's going to be a pit machine that kind of takes care of itself offensively as opposed to, man, 2021 was awesome. You know, now you got to expand that and move it forward into 22 and beyond. Uh, And I think, obviously, this is the first impression to do it. And you're not doing it against, no disrespect, a group of five or an FCS opponent. You're doing it against a bitter rival who used to be an interconference rival that really wants to to pull the upset here. So the atmosphere should take care of that part of it, but the on-field product should further that pit narrative pretty early on. And it's a heck of a stage for that first impression. So I, I, I think it helps all involved uh, from the pit perspective, assuming you don't get blown out or something like that. Well, certainly Pitt isn't planning on getting blown out, <laughs> but I, I do want to kind of put those ACC title, Addison Pickett, everything together. Not that Pitt's recruiting class this year hasn't been good. It's a pretty good recruiting class. I think they're putting together a really talented group of players here. Obviously, Kenny Minchie, and then if Hiking Williams somehow does come, that's the cherry on top. But John, you look at the stars, and I know people get on stars a lot. They love the four stars. They love the five stars. A lot of people were expecting Pitt to all of a sudden jump up from where they were recruiting to, say, Michigan State, Penn State level. That hasn't really happened quite yet. Now, is it? Why do? You, what does it take to get a star bump in your <laughs> recruiting classes consistently? Because I'm certain the fans – uh, can they they care about that even if say a lot of these three stars that Pitt has are clearly very good yeah that's a good question you know I think part of that comes with that long-standing perception like you said moving on from that 2021 year and, and becoming one of those programs that you could hold accountable to where those evaluations and data points now weigh in on our side of the business and and I'm, I'm a an evaluator that absolutely weighs other folks evaluation in trying to build my own. Um, But a lot of people don't do that. But when you start to win a lot more and you have that kind of that culture that is just 
at the highest level of expectation, which, of course, in the ACC, that's Clemson. At, at the moment, you start to get more of those benefit of the doubts. And, yeah, when, when all things are even and, and, and certain positions, Pitt is prioritizing a recruit, they will get that bump. They will get that benefit of the doubt from those uh, in our position who are ranking uh, and starring or rating some of these players uh, that Pitt is after. But I also think, look, everything's still in front of, of this class of 2023. These kids are, are one or zero games into their senior season. So these verbal commitments can play their way into bumps relative to their position. So if you're Kenny Minchie, continue that upward trajectory, that production, that efficiency that, we, that we've seen on tape further that more as a senior if you're one of these pass rushers rack up the production tackles for loss and sack numbers kind of force your hand uh, when it comes to reevaluating the class can't speak for everybody who does it in different recruiting outlets but at the outset the senior season evaluation is the most important one that should be under consideration so in that regard everything is still in front of all these pit verbal commitments and targets so everything is in front of them to potentially force and play their way into higher consideration uh, going forward. And again, as, as the more winning and, and great classes are stacked up on top of each other, I think that benefit of that will be created and it will look and feel a lot more like a Penn State recruiting class, uh, like a maybe even a Clemson recruiting class down the line where every single recruit is under at least blue chip consideration, if not already in that realm. It, it takes a level of sustainability to get to that point and Pitt appears to be on that track but to me they're not quite there just yet and let's also address the elephant in the room Pitt is in the northeast it is it is the region of the country where there are the least amount of boots on the ground in our department and in our industry right where we're located in the south uh, Atlanta certainly in Texas California even in the Ohio's and uh, bigger metros in the western part of this country not as much in the Northeast. Uh, so that is part of the issue there as well. How many in-person evaluations are you making and saying, hey, make a phone call to your manager and say, hey, this kid needs a bit of a bump. I'm watching him in person and oh my goodness, he, he's a superstar. That just doesn't happen as much in that part of the country. Now Pitt has recruited beyond the footprint. So there's an opportunity for some of those guys to grab it, but also locally uh, a little bit harder of, of a mountain to climb in that regard. Pitts recruit very well out of the Northeast, too. Look at some of the top players on their team. They're from the Northeast. Servasier Dennis was a two-star mm -hmm. in essentially the middle of nowhere in New York, and he's been an all-ACC player. Israel Abanikan is their starting running back. Jared Wayne's out of Canada. I was going to say um, the Canadians, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, like, I mean, they got Canadians here. Uh, they have a number of very good players from the Northeast. Kenny Pickett was from New Jersey. I mean, like there is a lot of footprint in that area that they have done well with. Um, and so they were they pulled two really good recruits out of the Buffalo area, Jimmy Scott and Addison Copeland last year. Um, so the Northeast has been kind to Pitt, but they haven't seen the bump that say they maybe have wanted. Or I, I think the I, I'll say this: I don't want to say they wanted the fans wanted because I think the Pitt staff is ecstatic with the guys they have right now. Now, I wanted to ask you, you talked about maybe those guys getting bumps. Who are some guys in this class that can get bumps? Because if you look at, let's just go by 24-7 composite, because that's usually a standard of kind of everyone. The top recruits, obviously Kenny Minchie is the top recruit right on the board. Then it goes Bryce Pollock, Isaiah Neal, Kenny Johnson, Antonio Kamen, Zion Fowler, Philip Daniels, Lamar Seymour, and then there's a ton of other guys. But who could maybe be those four-star bumps? Because in the past years, Penn has had a number of those guys late in the process get that four-star bump. Well, I think when you when you look at it from a production and performance perspective, you got to go with some of the offensive players first, right? They just have a lot more in front of them because, look, if you're a great wide receiver like a Kenny Johnson from PA, you're going to be the focal point of your offense. Ditto for Lamar Seymour and some of these other players, Zion Fowler as well. So they're going to have everything in front of them from a production standpoint. So naturally, you always look at wide receivers, especially as the entire sport, uh, the football world, is considering wide receiver like that next premium position anyway. They're like on the doorstep of, of kicking it down and, and becoming that next premium position. So we're watching and tracking that position more already. So naturally, those are the guys initially that you look for to potentially get some bumps because they're just easier to track from a statistical perspective. And then I think you look at some of the other premium spots. Pass rushers absolutely 
become a part of this. So your Isaiah Neal's out of St. Francis, which, my gosh, you talk about exposure. That school will be watched about as much as any high school program in the country. Antonio Kamen down at Tampa Bay Tech went to the state championship game last year. If they have another big run, he'll be a huge part of that. Had uber elite production in 2021. If he starts to follow that up this fall, again, the exposure will sort of take care of itself for some of those prospects. A little bit harder for the offensive linemen or the more under-the-radar prospects that we don't get to see from a numbers perspective in the fall. But wide receiver, defensive back, quarterback, I mean, Kenny Minchie should already be up. I mean, he's an SI-99 guy for a reason. And by the way, he's going to stick with Pitt in case that's not breaking news on this podcast. All of those things will, will sort of take care of themselves. So naturally lean towards offense or some of the easier to track players on defense when, when it comes to statistics. So pass rushers, defensive linemen in particular. Well, I think you just broke some news because I, I think there still wasn't necessarily a soup. I think people were starting to feel it's that. Not a, it's a, not 100%, but it, the, I got a call this week about some plans at Notre Dame and they did not involve increasing the pursuit of Kenny Minchie. So I, I'm leaning towards him sticking with Pitt at this point. Let me put it that way and, and give myself a little bit more room for, for some change here. Well, that's big news because, listen, I don't care how many four-stars you have in the class. If the one four-star you have is the quarterback, <laughs> and he's played that well at Elite 11 at every camp in game, and you're beating out some really, really good schools for his stuff, I, that that's a good enough recruiting class already. Quarterback's the most important position on the field, John. So if Minchie sticks, I, I think that just changes the narrative completely regardless of what happens. 100%. Yeah, that's that's where my gut is right now. Uh, things can always change in recruiting. We know that. But if I had to make the call today, Kenny Minchie sticks with Pitt over Notre Dame and anyone else who's jumping in the conversation. Well, there you have it, folks. Kenny Minchie hopefully does stick with Pitt, signs the dotted line, and comes to the UPMC Ruling Sports Complex in the spring. But, John, as always, thanks for coming on. Tell them where they can find stuff, follow you, read your stuff, do all that great stuff. Yeah, real simple, si.com slash college or check us out on social media. We'll be talking a lot of college ball this fall at John Garcia underscore JR. Folks, as always, thanks for watching as we end it as always. Hail to pit.